Hi, hey everyone. Welcome. How's everyone doing? It's going to take me a minute to get used to talking into this thing, so, all right. Um, welcome to tonight's event, the panel discussion for Concerning Human Understanding. Um, tonight's event is presented in conjunction with the Summer Residency Program Alumni Exhibition on view in the Visual and Critical Studies Gallery, which you guys just visited. Uh, hopefully, you've all had a chance to view the show, which investigates artistic production through language and engages a discourse on communication, understanding, and society. Just a little word about SVA's summer residency programs, which I've been working with for many, many years. I'm, just to introduce myself, I'm Karen Moscovich, and I'm the Assistant Director of Special Programs in the Division of Continuing Education. Um, and I've been working with the summer residency for almost a decade, actually. So it's kind of like my baby. Um, and uh, the summer residencies here in New York City offer artists, designers, and creative thinkers time, space, and a supportive community in which to develop ideas and focus on their artistic direction. We offer studio residencies as well as a variety of professional immersion programs that provide opportunities for artists to explore new areas of social and technological practice and engage critically within their field, which is kind of the theme of what we're doing with this exhibition and with this panel. I've been honored to work, to work with Sandra Erbacher, Mariana Ollinger, and Tim Roseborough while they were artists in residence here at SVA at various points over the last five years as well as throughout the process of curating and installing the show. And I'm really excited to have them join us here tonight along with special guest, art writer, and SVA faculty member, Thurza Nichols Goodeve. Sandra, Mariana, and Tim all employ various codes and deconstruct those codes to comment on a wide range of issues, including aesthetic production, institutional infrastructure, and socioeconomic constructs. This exhibition seeks to generate dialogue about art practice as both a building of a new language and a subversion of existing language structures that perhaps belong to a dominant order. Together, these works provoke discourse on the ways that artistic language structures run parallel to, intersect, and interact with spoken and written language. I just want to give you a little introduction to our panelists tonight by giving you a little bit of background on who they are and what they've been doing. Sandra Erbacher is a German artist living and working in Providence, Rhode Island. She earned her BFA from Camberwell College of Art in London and her MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has exhibited nationally and internationally at Grin Providence, the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center, the Chazen Museum of Art Madison, Mana Contemporary Art Center, the Chazen Museum of Art Madison, Mana Contemporary Chicago, Circuit 12 Contemporary Dallas, the Contemporary London, Kunstib I can't pronounce that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Kunstverein, Spire, Germany, all right. Umbrella Gallery, Leeds, and Five Years London. She's the recipient of the 2014 Chazen Prize to an Outstanding MFA Student, a University of Wisconsin Fellowship, and the Blink Grant for Public Art in 2013. In this exhibition, Sandra questions and disrupts the authoritative monolith of institutions through playful critique of objects and language. Tim Roseborough is a digital artist and musician living and working in San Francisco, California. His work has been included in numerous publications including Art Forum, Art in America, Art News, Hyperallergic, and the San Francisco Chronicle, San Francisco Arts Monthly, the SF Examiner, and the San Francisco Bay Guardian. He has performed and shown artwork at the 2012 and 2010 Zero One New Media Biennials, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Arts, Pro Arts, Soma Arts Cultural Center, Root Division, and Catherine Clark Galleries in San Francisco. Tim has been awarded residencies at the Cala Art Institute in Berkeley, ASC Projects in San Francisco, and of course, the School of Visual Arts in New York City. 
In this exhibition, Tim challenges the viewing of artworks by using his own self-designed English system to provoke a debate between written language and visual art. Mariana Olinger is a Brazilian artist currently based in New York City. She studied arts both at Parque Lage School of Visual Arts in Rio, the National Academy, and the National Academy Museum and School. She has an MSc in Social Policy and Planning from the London School of Economics and a PhD in Urban Planning from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Her artwork builds narratives and epistemic genealogies via actions, images, sound, text, interactions, and objects. Memory and identity have been recurrent themes of her work, which has been shown both in New York City and in Rio de Janeiro. She is also an active collaborator of the Brazilian independent media collective, Media Ninja. Her work has been exhibited at the National Academy Museum, School of Visual Arts, Parque Lage, and Casa Mata Gallery. She has performed at Judson Memorial Church, AW Asia, Museum of Modern, <coughs> Modern Art of Rio, <clears throat> excuse me, Museum of Modern Art of Rio de Janeiro, Lago das Artes, Lu Magnus, and Teatro Ipanema. In her video composition, Wearing the Inside Out, Mariana investigates madness as a language through the process of deconstructing her own documentary film about a defunct mental institution. Thurza Nichols Goodeep is a faculty member at the School of Visual Arts in the MFA in Art Practice fine arts, and computer arts programs. She has published widely on art and culture for Art Forum, Art in America, The Brooklyn Rail, numerous artists' catalogs, and is the author of How Like a Leaf, an interview portrait of Donna J. Haraway. Her most recent essays are The Cat is My Medium, The Art and Writing of Carolee Schneemann, in the Art Journal, Spring 2015, Bill Berkson, Fingers at the Tips of His Words, in Four Bill, Hadia Shafie, a painter whose heart is made of poetry in Surface, Leila Heller Gallery. In the absence of grief, there's no absolute condition, the paintings of Joan Waltermath. And when attitude becomes a foundation. Making the impossible possible in, is that an exhibition, Thurza, or a? It's an article that's in the Brooklyn Rail. Awesome. So making the impossible possible in the Brooklyn Rail uh, is, in the, in, is in the current issue of the Brooklyn Rail. The title of, of this exhibition is borrowed from philosopher John Locke, who in 1689 published the verbose and exhaustively detailed treatise entitled An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, in which he claims that understanding is, quote, the most elevated faculty of the soul. Among other claims, he argues that there is no such thing as innate knowledge and that all language is built upon experience and observation, sensation and reflection, body and mind. This conversation may act as a dialogue, debate, and playful banter with Locke, as well as a variety of other thinkers that may be brought into the fold. For the purposes of this discussion, I will invite you into discourse about a variety of themes, some more abstract than others, and all meant to function as points of inspiration. These include, but are not limited to, power, knowledge, poetry, prolixity, memory, ideas, essence, communication, intimacy, and identity. So without further ado, uh, I would like to present the three artists in the show and art writer Thurza Goodeve to give short presentations about their own work so you get a little bit of a background about what happened in the show, what we're trying to create, and the conversation that has already been taken place. And then we'll sit down and we'll have a little bit more of an informal conversation as well as Q&A where we invite all of you to join in the conversation. So I would love to invite Sandra to come up first. So, um, hi, my name is Sandra Rebecca. <laughs> and um, thank you, first of all, thank you so much, Karen, for putting on this fantastic show. And um, uh, it was a pleasure to uh, join all of you uh, doing the show. And was it's a very kind of 
fitting show for my work and was very inspiring as well and still is um, preparing for this talk and just thinking about um, the ideas. So I'm very pleased that I'm part of the show. <laughs> so um, I'm going to briefly introduce um, my work going back about a year and a half to you as a little background um, to the work that's in the show and um, a kind of conceptual framework that I've been dealing with. Can you hear me or shall I? Close up. Okay, <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> um, so um, the the work um, about a year and a half ago, or prior to that, also I've been dealing with a pretty classical um, um, institutional critique um, type of. Um, conceptual framework, so 70s institutional critique, looking at the institution of the museum, kind of deconstructing architectural elements of the museum in particular. Um, and then um, feeling that um, I've been like hitting my head against the brick wall pretty much, um, um, I felt the need I needed to expand um, the, first of all, what institution means to me. Um, I felt um, a little bit that, that that discourse was a little bit too restrictive, and um, I substituted the the term uh, bureaucracy um, for institutions. So really, institutions in a much larger, broader sense, um, bureaucracies or corporate kind of office culture. Um, and for critique, um, I kind of um, substituted or added the word humor. Um, as a critical tool, really, which uh, you'll find in a lot of my work, although it's a very subtle kind of humor, as you'll see. Um, but enough of that, I'll show you the first slides. <laughs> um, so this is part, the first three slides are part of a show that I did, a solo show at the Chazen Museum of Arts, um, about a year ago. That was my MFA show, actually. And um, I was presented with this really um, weird, uh, space that was not a typical white cube space, but had loads, low ceilings and a marble floor. And um, it looked more like a corporate lobby than a, a museum or gallery space. Um, and I didn't really want to bring work into the space um, that I've done prior to that. So I spent about two weeks just roaming the museum and um, looking at um, at the little kind of architectural um, oddities or features and, um, um, and, and trying to figure out how I could respond to those. So um, this is a piece called Resistance Weave and it's literally um, a kind of uh, looped carpet. Um, and I came, um, I came, the idea came to me um, walking through the basement of the museum and um, discovering that all the walls in the basement were carpeted. Um, and uh, I spoke with the museum director and he said, well, yeah, in the 70s, you know, all of the gallery walls actually were covered in that really bland beige carpet. And which, first of all, that was odd to me in and of itself. And then I noticed there were like abrasions, like rectangular abrasions on the carpet where the frames hung. So I thought, hmm, <laughs> how can I say use that as a as a language or yeah, as a language um, in and of itself? So um, I started shaving into the carpet, and what you see here is um, an anarchy symbol. So I'm interested in in symbolism, political symbols, and um, I drew it in a way as if I was imagining um, a, a little child would draw, not knowing what anarchy really is or means. Um, so a really kind of awkward symbol um, sitting there. And um, also very similar to Franz Klein's abstract expressionist Martin making. And funnily enough, like in the atrium of the museum, right behind that painting as was one of his canvases hanging there. <laughs> so that was an interesting little addition um, to the dialogue. Um, the next piece that was part of the show um, was uh, this uh, piece that I called Color Me Kitten. And it was um, prompted by uh, the founder's plaque that was um, sitting at the entrance um, to the museum. And I used a uh, kitchen countertop <laughs> laminate, basically. and um, I CNC routed uh, these titles or these um, these names uh, into the countertop, and um, they 
again came about like talking to this time the preparators of the museum and they were asking me oh um, what color paint do you want as a background um, for your show uh, right now you have Bauhaus buff in there and I was like oh <laughs> that's a cool name I like that <laughs> <laughs> and I got talking to them, like, yeah, we have all sorts of weird paint names, like Grey Kitten and all of that. So I asked them if they could do some research for me, and they gave me a list of all the paint names dating back to the, the day the museum was opened. And um, so I listed the names with their codes. Um, and the list format was inspired by Georges Perec's um, Species of Spaces and other um, essays. Um, uh, and where he literally, I mean, one, one essay was he, he sits at his desk and he lists, lists in, a, in a very poetic style um, whatever is accumulating on his desk. And it's actually very beautiful language. So um, I came up with a list format of just this very banal, um, um, everyday thing in the museum that we walk past but again it's a structural element of the museum so it's you could say it's a it's a metaphor for the the ideological um the the what's behind the walls of the museum really um this um piece the sculptural piece so two pieces in there a sculptural piece is called um you know she's a little bit dangerous and Whoever is um, kind of my age will remember maybe a uh, rock set from the 80s, <laughs> like Euro trash um, band, or Swedish. Um, so I, um, so physically, it's it's a response to the duct work that was um, in the museum. It's an air return, and I made it really almost like a sculptural intruder here. So really awkwardly, like coming down from the ceiling, right in the center of the gallery. So it. It, it couldn't have been just like an accident or a bad uh, architectural or design choice. It's, you know, it's, it's irking, it's, it's not meant to be there. <laughs> and the second part of it um, is um, the sound that plays when you come into the gallery. And I'll just quickly show you a little um, sample of that. <laughs> You'll hear the muffled version of said song, you know, she's a little bit dangerous, <laughs> which is also kind of, so I wanted it to sound uh, like, you know, someone in the basement was having a party, really, and you could hear it through the, the, the duct work. Um, so an oral and a, a sculptural uh, invasion, pretty much. Um, and there's also this tongue-in-cheek part, you know, like as um, a, a piece of institutional criticism, you know, she's a little bit dangerous, but she, she really isn't, you know, because she's working from within the, the four walls of the museum. So it's <laughs> so there's that kind of nod to, and, and I, I kind of knew um, within myself that I was already moving past that classical notion of institutional critique and moving somewhere else. And um, the work behind that um, was my first large format uh, photograph um, in a, um, and it's just called Monument, in um, a, um, uh, what's the word? A stock photograph format, so used in advertising. So, I, and there's that idea of, um, you know, blankness that comes in a, a certain kind of, I wanted, the object um, to come across more as a type rather than an, an having any individual individuality to it, and I was in, in that context envision, envisioning like the plants that the the museum staff might have sitting around in the office. Um, so then after that show, um, I moved into that um, that kind of second stage of my work where I was looking more at uh, this expanded version of the idea of the institutions and uh, bureaucracy in particular. And I was interested in um, like all the objects that you might find hanging about in like an office. Um, and how how these objects function really, because they're, they're kind of, um, they're there because um, um, to, to impose a sense of order um, or a, a sense of uh, maximize efficiency in, in the work, working environment. So 
Um, they have to do with, uh, I mean, if we're talking about bureaucracy being uh, a, an imposition of a sense of like rational control, um, uh, rational and hierarchical uh, system of control, then they're aiding that um, in, in their own little small way. And I wanted to play with that and mess with that and subvert that a little bit. In, in various ways. Um, so this, what you, this piece that you're seeing is also a large format photograph. Um, uh, this is uh, another neon piece, and it functions uh, called Goat Rodeo, and it functions very similarly um, to the one that's in the gallery at the moment, the TIIC, uh, in the sense that both are borrowed from um, corporate jargon or office jargon. Um, and uh, goat rodeo basically means um, something like, uh, or it denotes a very chaotic situation in a corporate environment. Um, and I just, you know, I just found it really um, visually, you know, it just calls forth like funny images <laughs> when, um, when someone sees it. And um, yeah, it's just that kind of jarring effect of, um, um, what happens if you um, expropriate um, a kind of term and in, insert it into a completely different scenario or context? And that kind of funny, humorous, like little disruption or, or puzzling sense of um, not knowing what's going on. So that kind of, that's what I was after with that. And the TIIC um, means, uh, is, is a, an acronym um, that apparently people um, insert into their email uh, communications um, uh, to express a kind of discontent or dislike of their superiors, which is, it's just short for um, the idiots in charge, basically. Um, then this is another piece um, that, again, uses language in a different way. And it's a response to um, a, a curatorial invitation um, from, it's, so there, there is um, this show called Do It, and it's a running show. Um, the original was curated by Hans Ulrich, Ulrich Obrist. And um, it's a, a kind of open exhibition um, format where artists, um, wrote prompts and then these prompts get redistributed to other artists and I've chosen um, so the, the piece that I responded most to was a piece by Hannah Weinberger and she works with um, onomatopoeias um, and um, so I I, um, I was just given a list of onomatopoeias and I decided to read them out in a really kind of dull and monotonous voice as if uh, belonging to an accountant really oh no, i can't show you the piece <laughs> sorry um uh like a, a, a an emotionless kind of voice uh, belonging to an accountant and then um i would uh, manipulate that in a in an audio program and layer it so it would turn into a complete kind of gibberish like a soundscape of almost like a piece of progressive kind of not music, but somewhere in between poetry or uh, gibberish, pretty much. <laughs> um, and um, so that, that sat in um, the gallery space, pretty much like that on the wall. Um, and people could, um, people did interact with it and um, started bursting out <laughs> laughing. Um, actually, funny little uh, story because the, the writer from the Boston Globe came into the show and reviewed it and at first she was walking around and really unsure of herself and really kind of puzzled and then asked the gallerist after like 10 minutes or so is it okay if I laugh in here <laughs> so she was really she didn't know how to take the this very subtle sense of humor you know and then she picked up the phone and just started laughing and didn't stop apparently <laughs> Um, so, clatter, munch, ho ho ho, clap, holler, honk, cloud, hubbub, buzz, toot, num, hoff. Anyway, it's on my website if you're interested. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in that show was also um, another piece, another little, oh, God, pardon me, <laughs> um, a little bronze cast of a Starbucks cup. And there's another funny moment, um, and it, it's just kind of sitting there at the bottom as if it was 
you know, discarded. It just happens in museums. Someone leaves their coffee cups in a co uh, cup in a corner, thinking nobody will notice. And um, a girl came in on a Saturday and um, stood in front of the um, the carpet and uh, wanted to take a picture of it. Put her coffee cup, her Dunkin' Donuts cup, down about like two feet uh, left to the to my bronze cup and then meandered and walked right out of the show. And again, my gallerist was laughing and sending me a picture, like taking an install shot of like art imitating life, imitating art, you know, just, yeah, really funny, funny little moments that that show caused. <laughs> Um, so it kind of so that's what I mean by a sense of humor that's a little bit it's subtle yet subversive it kind of sneaks up on you and you might miss it you might yeah miss it if you're just kind of looking for the more sensationalist louder kind of stuff um, and so this piece um, moving on to the show that you see here uh, is called uh, it's one of my most recent pieces um, control alt delete and it's all it's a medium format photograph of um, an 80s style keyboard um, that I then manipulated in Photoshop to take all the, the letters and the numbers off the keys. And um, around about the time that I was making or working on it, I read a really interesting article by um, Jeremy Gilbert Rolf and it, it w that's called Blankness as a Signifier. And it really resonated with me because, you know, the stock photographs, there's something going on with blankness and blankness as a kind of potentiality and space for projection and a kind of um, communication through a refusal to communicate. So I think these things were the things that were kind of running through my head when, when I made this. Um, Yes, so, and, and then there's the dryer piece, which um, I haven't recorded yet, so you have to kind of <laughs> think back to it. And um, um, so there is also a sculptural element and a sound element um, that uh, collide or combine um, in the dryer piece. And um, the sound element is actually taken from um, the, the Cisco um, systems uh, it's the default hold music basically so i actually just heard it the other day when i had to call walgreens and was put on hold and <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so if you press the button that's what will play <laughs> and um yeah that's it <laughs> any questions or <laughs> at the end yeah. okay wonderful <laughs> So next up is Mariana Ollinger. And is it this one? Yes. You just play it. Hello, uh, my name is Mariana. Uh, well, first of all, thanks. Uh, Karen for putting up this. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in the show uh, with all of you. Thanks Thursa to be here and thanks, oh, thanks to all of you. Uh, I'm going to, I decided to focus on the, um, on the work I'm showing at, the, at this show tonight. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what is this about, where did it come from, so in what stages it is, since it is a working process, <laughs> uh, as most of my work, most of the time. Um, so basically, in 2011, I was introduced to this woman called Cassia Karenson uh, in Rio de Janeiro. Cassia is a dancer, she's a contemporary dancer. And she was called to work um, in a mental health institution back in 2004 in Rio de Janeiro, where, when this institution went through a federal intervention for ill treatment uh, in a period of two months, 64 patients died within the institution. There was thousands of people inside. So it was quite shocking because by 2004, most of us would think this would not happen anymore, but it was uh, one of those, it's pretty look, looked like one of those 70s, 60s, 70s, horrible mental health institutions. So when I met Cassia, she, I mean, so Cassia was invited to work there basically because the plan was to shut down the institution, 
but most patients were severely uh, impaired after spending many years there. Most of them would not walk, talk, like communion, look other people in the eyes. It was a very, very severe, um, they, they, have, they had been severely impacted by what they've been through there. And Cassie was called uh, because she works with uh, something that is called therapy through movement to try, and, to try and work with them through their bodies to get them to communicate again to a certain extent so they could be moved into smaller residential units. Um, so I, when I met Cassia, she was working with a group of patients that had already been moved to the, resident, the small residencies, um, about 20 of them maybe. And I was very impressed when I went to see her work for the first time, when I visit them. I had never been in a space with 20 people with severe uh, mental health uh, issues. And I remember getting in there and she looking at me and saying, just don't be scared. Um, look at me, look at how I deal with them um, and you should be fine. And so I was basically like observing her. And, and for me, it was really impressive how the way in which she communicated with them, uh, they still have very limited uh, speaking skills, speech skills. So for me, it was really striking to see how organically and she could communicate with them. And also by imitating her, how I could do it as well. <laughs> so without needing like a big explanation of how to do it or how to be careful with it, I just could do it. It was not that difficult. And I started to shoot, uh, to film Cassia's work with them, to photograph. So I've been following her work for about three years. And my idea was, at one point, became to make a documentary about it. And to one extent, I wanted to um, be able to, I wanted to create a documentation of what happened inside that institution in 2004 because there's very, very little record, public records of what happened there. I mean, if you Google it, you like, you find probably like two very small articles in newspaper that doesn't really talk much about it. It was very well hidden at the time. So to one extent, I wanted to have a register, public registration of what happened in there. But at the same time, I didn't want to build this documentary about the horrors of mental health institutions, which is a thing that, have been, that has been explored by several great filmmakers uh, throughout history. So when I came to New York last year, I decided I was going to see it and kind of dedicate time to figure what was this documentary going to be about, since I didn't want it to make a traditional documentary about the horrors of a mental health totalizing institution. And so first thing I did, I went through a lot of references, uh, films, uh, both documentary and, and fiction about the themes to try and understand. and like. A, Obviously, uh, I read, I mean, had uh, film, um, reading, and music references. So I built this reasonable amount of like references to make my own film. And at one point, I decided that instead of taking my own images, my documental images, and started to structure the documentary, I wanted to try and come up with a structure for the documentary before. I actually was using my own material in a way of trying to come up with a more poetic structure instead of a literal like based literary structure based on what happened and the interviews I have I have quite a few so as well instead of doing this like how do I how do I deconstruct the making of my own documentary and this is why actually it's one of the reasons like the title of this piece is wearing the inside out because for me, this piece is both about uh, looking for a language of my own film. So how do I build that? How do I communicate the feelings and the emotions, the sensations I have when I'm dealing with my, my object or my subject? Um, but at the same time, it talks about the theme itself. For me, when I talk about mad madness um, and the proposition I'm making here, which is that madness is a language, uh, I'm 
I'm also understand I'm talking about exposing the insides um, of, of a human being in general. And so basically I took uh, most of the images in the piece you saw there are um, come from my reference, some of my references, some of the, the most import important uh, filmic references for me, with the exception of two images, which are the green stairs and another one I'm gonna show later, um, which are mine. So basically I decided to, I, I, at one point I understood I, the theme of my film was, language, was madness as language because what really called my attention, what really drew me to Cass's work was the powerful way in which she could communicate with those people without using the same uh, tools that most of us use to communicate in general. And so I'm, I've decided to, I, I understood that at one point. And I also knew I wanted to make a social commentary about what happened in the institution, a critique about the horrors of what still happened like at that point in the institutions. But I wasn't really sure what were the motives, so how would I structure my documentary? And I tried to do that in this piece that's outside. So um, I, I started with these two images, which, uh, well, first a very, I mean, it's mine, but it's a very classical image of a spiral staircase, which has been used by several filmmakers before in different ways. I mean, Hitchcock is well known by those, and, but not only him. And it's often used to create tension and also a sort of a disorientation. It's a journey, but there is some sort of disorientation. Don't really know if it's, you're looking upwards, if you're looking down, it's a kind of like a confused image, which for me resonates a lot with uh, the feelings that I had during the time I was dealing with my, my theme. And at the same time, I, um, I also uh, appropriated that the second image, which is an image that comes from the film um, Mera and Sade, in, for, which for me, it's also like this, like, I mean, if you saw the film, it's very, is this, it, it begins with this very noisy confusion. Everyone is like yelling and running around. And suddenly, everyone retreats to their own cells that has this kind of circular shape, which is kind of symbolic to me as well. So I chose these two images to begin and end my piece. And, and then throughout the the piece, I'm going to, I, I kind of try to build the structure through identifying which would be the motives of my documentary. And I first, uh, I, I, use the, um, I use this image of the lines, which you can also see in the, in the print that's outside, which for me, it's a very open image. The idea was trying to work with uh, an abstract image and sound and rhythm to kind of give this um, to kind of give any space in which you can also put your own feelings and connect to the piece in the way you want is a way of creating space as well, sort of meditative but provocative, provocative image. This is how I, uh, how I uh, identify with it. Then I, I've, uh, we go, I, I, the second motive of my documentary uh, that I approach, I'm, I'm calling it meta discourses, which is kind of trying to see, trying to identify uh, in how uh, different like meta discourses can communicate things in different ways. And then I ended up act, uh, activating, I mean, uh, going after like the animal communication. There is music in there as well. There's this couple that communicates, but I took out their actual dialogue, so you can actually focus on their movement and the way they communicate with each other without the actual um, sound of what they're saying. Um, then I go, through, go to uh, next motive, which is be culture, rhythm, and depression, which is kind of like prepares you for what, for my, would, it should prepare it for the social commentary that is gonna come after that. So exploring a little bit what are some of the elements that are in our society that will lead to, in a way, um, my social commentary, which is the place of the mad in the capitalist society, um, but are 
pretty much present in everyone's lives anyway. Um, I then move forward to the social commentary and that is that image is mine as well. That is actually an image of the, the mental health institution Cassia was working in the intervention. And I try to wrap up with a more kind of positive take on it, like after going through my social commentary when I uh, make it very, uh, when I bring it to the, the, the issue of the incarceration and isolation of the mad in the capitalist society. Uh, after that, I try to like go back to a more humane uh, side of madness that I call the poetics of madness, in which I use, I bring back the lines again and uh, I also uh, show an image of, um, of a mental health institution in Brazil in the 70s in which they're having a sort of a party in the garden. Uh, the music, the sound that, there's a, um, that is playing is the original sound that was playing while they're dancing outside, which could be pretty much in the 70s, like anywhere, everywhere, but we actually look into a, to a um, to a group of people that are incarcerated in mostly very bad conditions. And like at first sight, you don't really realize that, but like if you pay attention to the images, you like slowly realize what is going on there. So I decided to wrap up my presentation showing a, um, the set from which that uh, print comes out. This is a, I've decided to show, I, uh, Karen actually invited me to this show in a show in which I was showing those prints. And I decided to call them Untitled. I was working on them simultaneously to the time I was working in the film. And a first version of the film, in the first version of the film, there's a lot more lines and like disorienting motions with the lines throughout the thing. But at one point I decided to give up that and focus more on like is starting to work more with uh, my filmic references as well. So for me, this is a first step. It, this is probably, that is probably the first structure of the documentary. But I haven't actually used any of my uh, material yet. So now is the point to me in which I can look at it and say, okay, this is my first structure, and now I can start to bring in my own material again. And it was a kind of an artifice that I used, so I didn't build um, predictable, uh, and I hope I don't, <laughs> uh, predictable, boring documentary that was based only on the images I had of the people and the interviews with people that know a lot about that situation throughout the film. So this is, this is it, I guess. Thank you. So next up is Tim Rosebro. Um, I, again, wanted to just reiterate all of the thank yous uh, to SVA, to Karen for organizing everything, to Thurza for moderating, and to Mariana and Sandra for being such great uh, showmates. It's been fun, even the little times we've been interacting, so it's been, it's been awesome. Um, <laughs> I realized that I actually created slides without language, but that's okay, I can just kind of um, talk through them. Uh, they're kind of showing up in a funny way. Excuse me just for a moment. I'm going to quit this and get this restarted. Uh, my name is Tim Roseboro. Um, I call myself a digital artist because in some way or another my work comes through a computer uh, generally and um, I wanted to kind of show some of the ways that the work does come through a computer and is output in different um, formats and different themes and forms. Um, but I wanted to center everything really around the show that's uh, showing right now. Um, I'm going to stop this. OK. Um, the show that uh, is showing right now concerning, concerning human understanding, I have a piece um, which is created in a writing system that I developed called Inglif. So essentially Inglif is English 
and hieroglyphics kind of conflated. So the main idea behind Inglyph was to bring a visual and element back to the language that we're really used to seeing all the time and make it somewhat mysterious again so that if you approach it without knowing how to read the system, it looks like some type of abstract uh, language or drawing or etchings. But if you know the system, then you can read it just like you can read English. It's actually a font and there are uh, the 26 letters that are in English or generally any Latin alphabet-based uh, language. So I just wanted to show a few projects that I have done in Inglef and talk a little bit in response to uh, some of the things that have been said previously. This is a project that I did um, in 2011. It's called All Fit Together. Uh, I think that Inglef is part of my practice because I'm interested broadly in the idea of games and play. I noticed that Sandra talked about humor. I try to engage, again, mystery and fun in my work. And the notion of games, puzzles, and play kind of wrap around Inglef as well as some of the other work that I do. In this project, I created uh, 32 laser cut pieces and that I glued together and each of them was a puzzle piece that was part of a larger piece which I then gave to colleagues and friends and this is actually someone's name when you look at it in English and I made a video in which I split the entire puzzle up and then I sent all these pieces out it was like a holiday piece so one of the themes is that this whole project will never be together again unless everybody comes back together. So you can see it in a, a, a video, like a visual form, but it won't ever be back together again, which I thought was kind of a neat idea. And this is actually the website that um, shows the two sides of this piece. So there's 64 pieces in all, and different names are engraved in these pieces. And on the website, you can actually see what names uh, are, they translate the, uh, them into English for you. Another piece that I did was a piece for Art Forum magazine, that is the September 23rd issue. Um, I wrote an essay about an idea that I've been really working on in my practice and wanted to kind of share that with the world called Meta Practice. Essentially, it is, Meta Practice is around an artist's practice, and it's how an artist's practice interfaces with the world. And it's my argument that that can become artistic expression in and of itself, as evidenced by this piece being a piece that's both an art piece but also part of a magazine. And then I talk a little bit about the history that I've seen of that practice with other artists that have done that in the past. So I did the research and kind of drew a thread through this type of work that I've seen. That also has a website that you can interact with um, and have fun with. So it in, uh, takes the first paragraph of the essay and makes animations in English if you interact with it. And I'm happy to tell people the URLs um, later on. Another piece that I did um, in 2014 for a publication called the San Francisco Arts Quarterly is also in my English language, it's called Retiring Words. The theme of this piece was I, I looked at the frequency of a number of derogatory terms and I ranked them by how long their entries were in uh, Wikipedia, which to me said something about their currency. In other words, if a word was really contested or, or a lot in the news as some terms are, I put it higher in the pyramid, and as the words were less talked about over time, they receded on this pyramid and kind of faded out, and those are, there, there are more words that kind of fade into the, uh, into the ether, down at the bottom of the pyramid. And the only way that you can know, unless you know how to read English, is by interacting, again, with another website that I created, so you can touch each of these terms and see what they are. 
but you can also make them disappear, which is what I would like to do. I'd like to retire all of these terms eventually. That's why it's called retiring words. And again, you can interact with these things online. A project that I did very recently, right before this one, one of the larger projects that I did was for the city of Berkeley. Uh, I engaged with the history of protest in Berkeley, California, and I did some research with the Berkeley Historical Society in California and found a number of images that featured people holding signs of protest, like we shall overcome or women need the Equal Rights Amendment, and these were from the 60s through the 80s. So I translated those banners into English, and I displayed um, seven of them in a big storefront window in Berkeley, California, and that ran for like a month for 24 hours. So it was very nice that it was a very publicly engaged project. And there is also a website connected with that where you can see the original photos and it translates the English for those banners as well. So that finally brings me here, but I'm just going to show the project that I'm working on right now, or that's actually there in the gallery. And this is the piece in the gallery. Um, this piece is called Words Are Stronger Than Art. It's currently featured in the show. Um, one of the things I like about the show in the way that all of our works interacted with each other is there is this idea of, in some way or another, a critique of some type of institution and also the architectures around those institutions, whether they are around how people with mental health um, issues are treated within an institution and within that architecture, as well as how um, objects are treated in an institution, in that case being a gallery. So for this piece, I was also commenting that on that as well. I kind of distilled the title of the piece from Words Are Stronger Than Art to Everything But Art, which is what is featured in this piece. And what I wanted to do is reverse the polarity of artwork versus wall. So often you'll see a white wall with an artwork in the middle of it. I wanted to make a blank canvas and put the Artwork, or the artwork around it in a way. And also make us, if you would like to read it that way, just to comment on how much context creates a piece of art. And so there might not even be anything in the middle of it, but all of the language and all the understanding about that artwork is actually around it as opposed to inside of it. So that brings me to where I am now and to this show, and um, that's my presentation. Thanks. And uh, last but not least, Thurza Nichols Goodeve. Hello, thank you. Um, you know, I, um, I'm just, I'm not a curator, but I've actually, I curated a show that's up also at SVA, um, at the SVA Art Gallery, opened up last night. And if I can get the sound to work, I wanted to end with some of those pieces. But what I wanted to, why I wanted to say that is um, it's quite impressive what you've done with the tiniest space possible, right? And I think, um, I think that, that the way you've translated this idea of art and language into using three very complicated artists who do it in very different ways but it's very elegant. Each one deals with the subject in a completely different way, different medium, different ways. So I just wanted to um, compliment you on that and thank you. Um, oh, good, because this is actually an image that I'd like to talk about at some point. But um, all right. Now, a couple of things. Um, what I prepared for this was just some notes, you know, sort of. Um, I'm going to put this up, though. This I just thought of just at the last minute. I'm going to put up because um, I just have I just have a few like sort of things to just sort of add because I'm more interested in the discussion, right? Um, and I'm here just as another member of the panel. I'm I'm not really a moderator, and I 
I am an art writer. Um, and um, when you said talk about my work, that that made me think I should mention this. That um, I actually have a I have a talk I did here in this exact room that's online on YouTube called "The Task of This Art Writer," and it actually is about the whole relationship of what, how, what an art writer does in relationship to art. And I wasn't planning on talking about this, but I thought I would just um, mention that I describe the way I write about art as writing with it, not on it. I go into it. Um, I am not a critic. I am not a historian. Um, I am not really a theorist, although I use theoretical writing. And so there's really no word to describe the kind of way I write. I often use different voices, it's very poetic. But it's always coming out of sort of just placing myself inside of the work. And I realize that it is, a, in a way, a form of translation when one is an art writer. But I certainly don't ever want that to be interpreted as um, here is a language that nobody can understand, and the art writer is the one who comes and opens it up. Um, I see myself as a fellow artist sort of working with the material to give another conversation about it um, that comes from that. And so the reason I brought up this quote is um, it's from Walter Benjamin, whose idea, he wrote a very famous article called The Task of the Translator, which some of you may have read. And he makes this case that the um, point of the translator, and here I'm reading from here, is not to mimic or copy, but transform the language, the original language, into the new language, right? And so it's not a one-to-one. -one. And it's very much how I see myself as an art writer, sort of using the language system, images, poetry, structure, mood, tone, whatever it is, um, to, to put it into, into words. And there's also an, a word that's used in art writing history called ekphrasis, or ekphrasis um, which is the verbal description of a nonverbal medium. Um, and um, in a way, you're always, you're always doing the impossible, because obviously, if these people were writers, they would be writing, right? So it's always about precisely what can't be put into language. That's the marvel of art. Um, but at the same time, language is an art, so you can put the two together. Anyway, so he says that, um, so it's about using the language that you are translating to transform the language in which the translation takes place. Quote, the task of the translator consists in finding that intended effect or intention upon the language into which he or she is translating, which produces the echo of the original. And then he has this beautiful long quote, um, aiming at the single spit, I love this, where the echo is able to give in its own language the reverberation of the work in the alien one. So in a way, again, the art writer is, is writing the reverberations, the vibrations. Um, and then he says, fragments of a vessel which are to be glued together must match one another on the smallest details. This is why the best art writing always has little details of, 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 of references to, to the work, um, but the most for me, um, kind of, and I would think most people, dull kind of art writing is one that just describes it. I mean, the description has to be an act of translation, ideally. Um, so fragments of a vessel which are to be glued together must match one another on the smallest details, though they need not be like one another. In the same way, a translation, instead of resembling the meaning of the original, must lovingly and in detail incorporate the originals, and then we'll use mode of signification, which I think is the best way of describing language and art if you want to combine the two. Thus making both the original and the translation recognizable as fragments of a greater language, just as fragments are part of a vessel. Walter Benjamin, among other things, was just a, um, an absolutely beautiful writer. Uh, unfortunately, in many critical studies programs, he sometimes is treated um, 
um, not as the poet artist he is, and that's really the way to think about it. That's just a bracket. Um, so I thought I just made a few sort of notes, and this is sort of to go into the idea of language and writing, and these are just sort of visual metaphors of what language is, and I, lo I just love these as pages of manuscripts annotated by famous writers. So if any of you, you know, ever have trouble, I, I work as a thesis director all the time, uh, working with artists on their thesis, and it, people seem to, 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 to not understand that, that writing is rewriting, 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 right? And so, so, so you should never feel insulted if you give somebody something to read um, and, and to edit and they come back with suggestions. As a writer, I love it. You know, it, it's the way you understand. Again, language is it needs an addresser. It needs an addressee. It's, a, it's an act of communication, as you mentioned, which is the same with art. Um, very much. So this is just one wonderful page from um, Henry James. <laughs> it's just uh, here's Vladimir Nabokov. I mean, these are these are these are in themselves just um, wonderful little pieces. You know, you could just hang them on the wall. This is some blog of a of a post of somebody showing what a writer is. Um, and then here's Proust. So remember, these are all people who weren't working on the computer, and we lose this. We lose this beautiful process. Um, so uh, you can have them of your own. All right. So this was, in a way, I, I just wanted to start us off with what is language, and it's very much what you were talking about. But it's, you know, I think the things that I wanted to think about, because I was thinking about what is art, what is language, um, and one of the things that all three artists do uh, which is both interesting and what makes it difficult is puts the onus on the uh, you, the viewer, to figure out these codes. You're not told. You know, I had to learn by talking with each of them or reading um, about their work. And um, 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 Marianne had a had a lovely little book that um, I have some p images of that was with hers. And it would have been nice if we could have all taken it because it had a lot of really important stuff in it. And so, um, so these are just from you know Wikipedia. And the thing I wanted to emphasize is that language is always about power, and that addresser address C thing is a, is an issue of power. We'll talk about this with madness. Um, simply put, obviously, language has to do with communication. It has a syntax. It has grammar. As John Locke said, it comes out of experience and sensation, but most importantly, it's learned. We can't, I, I, can't, I can't know exactly. I, lo I looked at your um, wonderful um, piece, and I love the blank, the inversion of wall, and, and that's just very, very funny, very clever. But, you know, I was, I was, I, I thought I was looking almost at Peter Halley's circuits or something, um, and I know that that's part of the reference. And even after I knew the code, even looking now, I kept trying to understand, you know, re read it. And so it's a whole thing I have to relearn. Um, anyway, and so, so you know that. Something learned, context as you spoke is very important. Um, and, you know, the, I grew up as the generation of semiotics and semiology, which was really the, the, the study of signs so that anything becomes a language system. Royal and Barth wrote about fashion as, as, a, as a language system. Uh, I um, taught film and have an MFA in cinema studies, and the early courses that I taught were called um, Film as Language. And so, you know, and it's exactly what Marianne is, 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 tr is trying to do. And I love this idea of discovering the language almost before the content or in between them, because that itself is an act of madness in a way, right? <laughs> um, and then finally, though, um, language is very much about building community and identity and of insiders and outsiders. And I think this is, this is a big issue with art. Um, and sometimes that is, is frustrating and what gives art a bad name to many people who go, what the hell is this, you know, especially with contemporary art. Um, but it's also what makes it so um, generative and, and, and interesting. All right, 
little critique moment now of the of the of the um, exhibition. I love that you used the John Locke um, concerning human understanding, um, written 1690, beginning of the Enlightenment, right? Um, when the whole idea of human and humanism uh, was given birth to. And in 2015, we have to kind of put what Derrida calls like kind of under erasure, those words. Because um, in 2015, human is itself a contested category. Um, and, and again, each of the work here is, is dealing with that. Um, what he says in the book is that language is what separates humans from other beings. Um, book four, book three focuses on words and rhythm. Locke connects words to the idea that they signify, claiming that man is unique in being able to separate sounds into distinct forms and signify them with concepts which become words, and then these words are built into language. So. We call this human exceptionalism. Now, um, so as you know, many, um, first of all, humans are animals, so it's a continuum, right? So it's really an interesting moment to update um, John Locke. And many of you, I mean, what animals have you heard of that, that um, have a language of some kind that communicate? Bees. Bees, yep. Ants, birds. Ants, birds. Almost there. Yeah. Dolphins. 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 And yeah, I mean, and, and, and this is the, 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 the sort of horrors of enlightenment, which, you know, was based on, on, on um, Descartes' idea that, that animals were machines and had no human emotion or feeling. And, um, and when people say, oh, you're anthropomorphizing, I find that a very offensive term because we're all animals. So why shouldn't animals also? Uh, be treated because we know they suffer. We know they they have some kind of communication. No, they are not objects. And so this. Um Oh, there's also clicking going on apparently in it. It's a series of three, they say, a series of deep-throated human-like garbled sounds, almost like someone had, had ailed, inhaled sulfur, sulfur hexafluoride, a gas that makes your voice deeper. Um, but they were different from what wild orangutans had heard before because they also saw some similarities with human speech. Um, why I put this up is also because it reminds me of the image of, of, of the mad when people, you know, the mad, um, um, the way we treat that animal. And again, another minor critique would be, I'm fascinated that you want to do this documentary on madness as language, whereas to me it's always about the absence of language. Um, and I mean, we could be, we can, we can talk, this could be one of the things we can talk about. Um, certainly depression is. Um, William Styron's one of the only people who's ever been able to write about, about it. It's a little bit, mental illness is a little bit but like art that way. It's very hard to translate. Um, and you can go, you can think about um, manic depression, you can think about all various time, kinds of, um, of illnesses. All right, let's see if this, yeah. Whatever. Okay. So these are just examples, but I, you know, they've done a lot more with um, uh, dolphins and um, certainly birds. Uh, and the idea is that to be alive, in a way, is is to communicate. You know, that might be the difference between living things and objects. Um, so just that's just a thought to throw out there. Um, and then where was this? Um, Oh, <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, as a cat lover, um, I always find this excruciating because cats do that because they're absolutely terrified. So we find it funny. But the cat's ears are back. When cats are, are scared, they lick their lips. And that cat is just freaking out. But it's, it's unbelievable to us because it's also saying no. So it's very hard not to at that point. Um, so there's just a, a sort of whatever uh, example of an interesting moment of um, language and art. I just thought I'd throw in, if, if we're going to think about what language is, art is, here's just one quote from Andre Malraux. Art is revolt, a protest against extinction, and I just brought that up because I think we know that many languages now are going extinct as well as species, and I think artists have a lot to do, and, and again, some of your projects are very much about creating new languages, um, looking at corporate language, um, certainly analyzing as we got to here um, with Mariana's wearing the inside out. Um, I don't think you can see this, but this is the quote that you use um, in your, from um, Michel Foucault, and it's a little bit small, so I'll read it. Um, the modern man no longer communicates with the madman. There is no common language, or rather, it no longer exists. The constitution of madness as mental illness at the end of the 18th century bears witness to a rupture in a dialogue gives the separation as already enacted, and expels from the memory all those imperfect words of no fixed syntax spoken falteringly in which the exchange between madness and reason was carried out. The language of psychiatry, which is a monologue by reason about madness, which you highlighted, could only have come into existence in such a silence. So again, that's the question of power, that the very act of naming, interpreting, I mean, this ghastly story, um, and I think you should not feel at all bad about making just a regular documentary because these, it, it's, it's, these stories are so important to tell, um, but that it's a power relation, um, certainly. Um, Anyway, and then you have your project. Moving on, because I don't want to go on too long, these are just sort of the ideas of what is madness, thinking about the DSM, for instance, is all about trying to find a language for madness, um, and there's all sorts of different things. And I just thought, again, to throw this out, bring in hysteria, because it's a very interesting relationship to language. Um, first of all, uh, here's a little ditty when Freud, Charcot was the, 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 the man who um, had an institute called the Salpetriere at the turn of the century and Freud went and all of the Paris public went, um, it was a social thing to do, and would watch the hysterics sort of perform. Um, and one of the ways is he would sort of, you know, almost touch them or, you know, tell, it was like he was, not that he, well, he was. It's a combination of, you know, leading them on and almost it's somewhat being a, a bit of a performer. So, art, so Freud actually even calls him not a thinker, but an artist. Um, it's the artistic that's prom prominent within Charcot's work. He and an associate, Paul Richter, published his Des Maniaques dans l'art and other work illustrating the correspondence between his iconography and representations of similar disorders um, in the history of fine arts. Uh, one of the things that's been written about quite a bit is this phenomenon called um, dermographia. And um, it's when uh, hysterics, quote unquote, um, you could actually write like words on the skin, and the skin would start to swell and welter and carry the message. Um, very powerful, very um, disturbing. Um, here, the, the word is just another word for, for um, demographia. There were um, doctors who would write Satan onto women. Um, and so, again, it's a very weird way of, of, of language and madness coming together um, as a kind of clash of systems because the hysterics body was always the thing that was um, symbolizing the illness and in the early 19th, in the 19th century, Freud's studies on hysteria is fascinating in terms of language because it's often the internalization of metaphors. Like he would be, you know, this is a book that led to psychoanalysis and he would, um, he would, uh, you know, it was actually a woman who invented the talking cure, a woman named Anna O. 
um, who is also um, Bertha Pappenheim. And through talking to these various women, they would all of a sudden come to a moment where they'd say something like, his look pierced my heart. And her symptom was having heart problems. Um, or I just couldn't go on, and this is a woman who couldn't walk. So really, ama it's an amazing book. It's really quite, a, it's case histories. It reads like literature. Um, I even um, took a course on Freud as literature. So just to end, I just wanted to add two more pieces that are from the show that I opened last night. Um, funny enough, one of our students um, decided to do a sort of performance. This is her grandmother. This is why I love this. Her grandmother is taking pictures of her. Her grandfather and her grandmother came, and they were just, they're artists, so it was totally cool. And what she did is she took, uh, there's an article that ha appeared in the New York Times that had 27 questions that if you ask someone, will create intimacy and you will fall in love, apparently, right? So she wrote these all on her body and walked around throughout the, um, throughout the performance. And the other one I wanted to end on, but it may not be possible to hear. Um, it's just a work in progress that this guy in our department um, is starting to make. And again, it's just another way um, to bring up this, this question of language is always about an inside and an outside and, a, and, and, and creates identities and discreates identities and which is the, the um, challenge that all of this work brings to us. So let's just see. It's three minutes and I will only play like a few, you know, 30 seconds of it because you'll get the idea. Do you have the time? Oh, you can. You have the time. Do you have the time? Do you have the time? You have the time. Do you have the time? You have time. You have time. You have time. Do you have time? Do you have time? You have time. You have time. You have time. You can be covered. You have time. You have time. Do you have the time? You have plenty of time. You need a lot 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 of time. It takes a lot of time. It requires a lot of time. This is my favorite time. one right here. Okay. So we'll stop right there. It take um, there, there was no Google Voice um, translator for that. And I just love it that this is a short sentence and in another language it's um, so long. This is a project that he's working on that, that is obviously, he, it's, it's about New York really. He's come to New York as an artist from Britain and he's fascinated by all the languages. And he found that there's 126 languages, no, there's 300 languages spoken just in New York City, uh, which blew my mind. And as you keep watching this and, and, and seeing it and hearing it, you really get that sense of, you know, language is about identities and about inside, outside, um, and um, creating home for people as well as creating dissonance between people. So that's all. Thank you. You know, as all of you were talking, I, I started thinking about um, this essay that I read by Barnett Newman, and it's one of my favorite pieces of writing where it's called The First Man Was an Artist. Mm -hmm. And it's this beautiful piece of writing that um, where he describes the first outburst of sound out of a human being and how we think about it in terms of oh we want food or we want to ask for something and that is the birth of language that we have some kind of need that we're trying to communicate but in this piece he actually claims that that first outburst is actually music and art mm -hmm. that, that is it that, that is the first utterance of creativity out of the human being and I just it gives me chills when I think about it um, and the reason I bring that up is in, in relationship to the, the, the idea of the relationship between art and language, and, and in particular art and writing, and the way that, you know, I was, I was extremely taken by your lecture, Thirza, where you talked about writing with art as opposed to writing about art. Um, for me, that really made a, um, a, a really big statement, not only about art making, but also about the creative practice of using words. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I would like to invite 
you all to respond to is this idea of the utterance as a creative practice and how that relates to your own work, how, you re how it relates to the intersection of the visual and the oral and the written and, and the, the tactile even. I just want to add, because I wanted to add something to that. First of all, the Barnett Newman is fantastic because we always, the cliche is to use the woman, the picture of the shadow, right? Uh, it, it's always a visual one, and he's immediately, you know, breaking down this barrier that art is only visual, that it's all of those. So that was really beautiful. Um, the David Ross t is the chair of the Department Art Practice, which is the MFA program low residency that I teach in and the work I was showing. And the motto of our department is um, art is not about the market, it's a conversation. And that's our definition actually of art and that um, art for, um, and, and I, uh, for, for, for him obviously, art is the writing and the making and the, you know, it's all of that. And um, many moons ago in 1995, I interviewed the artist Matthew Barney and one of the most interesting things he said to me was that he always, considered the, 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 the writing on his work as part of his own work. And I thought that was really quite wonderful. So anyway, just some comments. Go for it. And maybe you do, you know, do any of you, um, have, have you, I mean, I'm sure you've had people write where it's very frustrating because they don't get it. And I'd love to hear stories about that because um, that's interesting. Or ones where you learned, you know, and it took you to another place because it's a collaboration. Um, that actually um, reminds me of uh, that, uh, the writer from the Boston Globe and how right, she, right. exactly, and how she responded to um, my exhibition because prior to that, I'd never really consciously thought about using humor as a critical tool. I guess it was always somehow finding its way into the work, but I wasn't so much considering it intentionally as a, form of language or utterance exactly. um, or inflection perhaps um, so I mean that def so so there is definitely that element of interaction going on between art writers and um, the inspiration and the res they provide so the, the conversation they provide and the response that I'm giving them so very influential, yes. Well, and that, 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 that anecdote is so sad because the fact that she had to ask whether it was okay for her to laugh tells us too much about contemporary art and galleries. <laughs> yes, yeah. just, just laugh, you know? If you feel it, do it. <laughs> that point did strike me as well, that, and I typed that in, in, in my notes, the idea is, is it okay to laugh? So, but I just thought that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Said a lot about the whole a lot of the interactions that happen in these uh, spaces and around art. I can't really speak too much to people writing about my art, but I can say that I find myself writing more, and I'm trying to really get to the core just really briefly of why I want to start writing. Well, I, I still do sometimes feel like some issues are complex enough that the visual may not it's, well, novels still exist. Visual art and novels and all kind of writing and, and journalism, they all exist side by side, so they all actually need each other. So when I made the title of this piece that's here, I was really saying it to be provocative, even perhaps cheeky, because I really don't really, have, I don't know if I really necessarily believe that, but it it's, uh, seems kind of interesting to say, and maybe would might start a discussion. But um, I just think that, yeah, I mean, language and visual art really need each other. And sometimes they don't. Um, again, sometimes I, I'm just, and it's really interesting, Thursday, you're talking about power, and it's true, I don't, I'm not just running to like give the key to, yeah. to the, the things that I have. I'm happy if people can understand it, but I'm not just trying to give it away because I wanted to keep that mystery a little bit. But I do understand that it is somewhat of a power play, and sometimes I am uncomfortable about that because I do feel people saying, like, well, who do you think you're going to just <laughs> make this and put it out there and be like a tease or something? And so I do understand that. So um, that's kind of what I can say about that so far. Well, I feel the mechanism of what you're doing or what we're doing about um, is, is much more 
interesting even than the actual words that you're putting into English. So it's really about, so I, I feel it's not not 100% necessary that people will understand um, all of the, or be able to translate all of it, but um, it's the mechanism and the, um, the um, uncovering of the fact that language has to do with power and keeps uh, some people in and other people out, um, which is, um, yeah, which is much more, I think, important or relevant to, to as long as they get the sense uh, come away with the sense of that that what the work uh, what's at the the heart of the work I feel then you've achieved your mission <laughs> as an artist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well for me the issue of writing it's very it, 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 it's one that is very present in my life right now because I, I have a very anarchic background I, as anyone who listened to my bio may have noticed so I was since very early ages, I was, I alternated being uh, both studying and practice like in arts, but also it got to this point in which from the, from the family and the place I come from, arts was not a career possibility. Mm. So it got to this point that I just kind of like naturally was like channeled to another discipline. And so, in a big, a big portion of my life, uh, maybe for about 10 years, I found myself in between a process of understanding, comprehending the world that was very um, um, organic, emotional, and another one which was very rational and structured. So people who know me, who knows me well in my history and my work can see that very clear in my work in general. It's a kind of a constant debate between rationality and kind of breaking that up. And I think this particular work, and, and I've not too long ago uh, finished a PhD in which a PhD I started many years ago uh, in urban planning, which was a very rational mm -hmm. discipline. Mm -hmm. And I was not long ago talking to Karen actually about it, uh, that I feel now that I'm kind of relearning how to write. Yeah, of course. Well, yeah, that's because it's like, I, 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 yeah. I, wrote, <laughs> I wrote my entire life a lot. Yeah. I have diaries for probably the past 18 years. Yeah. And it's funny when you showed, I was fascinated by the images you were showing, you know, the handwritings of different people, mm -hmm. different artists or theorists. And I, I, I made an exercise not too long ago of like photographing my diaries nice. in different moments. Mm. And I could see totally different handwritings. Yes. And I was like, oh my God, what is this? Should I do a work about it? Mm. But uh, this is an issue that I'm actually debating right now and I think this work relates to that as well mm -hmm. because in a sense like I, I did I, I did I did uh, I wrote a screenplays before for documentaries mm -hmm. and I also worked as a researcher for documentary making for other directors at different points so I kind of know how to make it I yeah. know like the traditional structure so it would not be too difficult for me just to get my images my interviews and okay this is how it works da -da 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 -da. And I just didn't want to do it that way. Exactly. Yeah. And then when you said it, when you said it, when you're in your lecture, when you were saying that it's okay to show the horrors about the institutions, and I said, yeah, it is okay, and I want, and I, I will. Yeah, right. How could <laughs> I you am already. Yeah, yeah, exactly. and I will. But I just don't want to make it about that. Right, right. You want to, yeah. Well, because, you want to make it about this issue of madness and language. Yeah. Which so is, you're seeking to find which the right is, language. Which is about yeah. talking, which is for me, it's about talking, it's talking about possibilities. Yeah. So because mostly still in society, madness is seen as an impossibility. And from my experience with what I saw and, and, and how I saw it, and it's, of course, it can be, I mean, madness has a lot to do with pain as well, and and it's difficult, and and it's not beautiful most no. of the time. It's awful. But from my experience, from what I saw looking at Cass's work, it doesn't have to be what it currently is. Still, I mean, there's a lot of possibilities to deal with it, 
And my short story about when kind of when that kind of clicked to me was when after looking at her work for a while, I was already following her for a couple of years, I was in a coffee shop and suddenly someone came in and it was probably someone who, I mean, it was certain someone who had some mental illness that I didn't know what was it, but probably someone who was well cared for, had a family and had kind of like minimum communication skills, could walk around, buy things, and this person got there and she got to the counter, she asked for something, the person in the counter didn't really understand what she wanted, she paid for something and then she went to actually get her food, whatever it was, and the second person behind the counter understood even less what she wanted. Mm. And eventually there was this situation in which this person was like, mm, and this other person in the counter, uh, behind the counter was getting really, really um, angry about it all. Mm. And she was kind of like about, she's starting to be rude. Mm. Like, of can course. you, I mean, this is not what you want, but what, how can I know what you want? And for me, like, I felt immediately compelled to intervene. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I just, I looked at the, the attendant and I said, just come down, wait a sec, and we'll figure what this person wants. Good. And then I looked at the person and I was like, I tried to communicate with her by imitating what I saw Kasia doing most of the time, hmm. which was pretty much kind of like trying to like get into her like trying to get her to look in my eyes, like moving slowly, talking like in a, like a low volume. And I pretty much said, can you tell me what you want? Like, is it this, is it this? And it was like, any like a minute would figure. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And the person got what she wanted and she ate and she left and she paid for it. And I was like, and, and then she, as she left, there was a second person, like a second person as myself, a client, that looked at me and said, Ah, oh, you see, families shouldn't allow people like this to be out. Mm -hmm. And I was and, and then I was like, go. No, yeah. darling, this is the opposite. Like <laughs> it's like it's so great that even though she has limitations, she can actually be part of our society. Mm -hmm. I like maybe the case is that we have to be a little more skilled to how to interact. And I mean during I mean during many, many years people that were not mental that were not really mental ill but had limitations regarding to just to the speech. Or like, autism. Or kind of exactly, exactly, autism class, exactly so classifying yeah. it was were classified by mental ill and incarcerated just because we yeah. the normal <laughs> were not able to actually understand their language and communicate with them. So this is kind of my Yeah. That's a beautiful okay. story. I want to jump off on something that you said when you mentioned that you have an anarchic background. Um, and one of the things that I, you know, I know you very well, and I know that you, I know your background and your work has often dealt with this idea of anarchy. But thinking about the other work here, and I would even argue some of the work that you do in terms of you know, your thinking, there's a there's a touch of anarchy, anarchy mm, nice. to it. Um, even even in just this idea of blurring the boundaries between the visual and the written. Um, so one of the, and another thing that I've been thinking about a lot is this idea of poetics, and this idea of poetics as di disorder of language. Um, so I'm kind of curious to hear you talk about how the, this idea of anarchy interacts with language. How does language give shape to anarchy? How, how does how does language possibly serve anarchy? And and for that, I guess in a way, I'm looking for an answer as to why so many artists are anarchists. Like why there's this relationship. <laughs> we hate rules. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's like one answer. So I'm I'm I am really curious about about the the functionality of that too. Like how that sort of functions in in and this level of, of communication and, and why we are the way that we are. Um, I, it's funny that you'd mentioned things like anarchy. Um, I'm really into order. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean anything really. But that, that what, what I just said there doesn't, doesn't really have any import here. But um, I think the idea of prolix is that what the Pro prolixity prolixity. That creates a type of anarchy because, and I'm not really 
excited about that, especially sometimes when we use too much language and yeah. this whole idea of international art English, I think that's what mm -hmm. it's called, um, which serves many purposes. I'd say one of the biggest ones is to create boundaries as to what art is and how you can talk about it to make sure that it's understood as a certain thing. And instead of simplifying things, you really purposely complicate them. That's a type of anarchy to me. Um, the only thing that I don't think that's good is that's good about that is that, well, it creates confusion. But if that's what the purpose is, then I guess that's what it's supposed to do. So if you want to be an anarchist, just talk more and more about it and as as obtusely as you can, and you'll succeed. <laughs> That's just my view. Um, the, the, the word that I um, don't know how to pronounce, prolixity? Prolixity. I actually prolixity. wrote a little, a little, little thing that yeah. was in the Brooklyn Rail. I, I have it here. That's oh. why I've, I've referenced oh. it, this whole, this whole idea of, of the... You should define um, it for people, because I, I wasn't really sure what it meant. So what, so what you wrote, and I quote, <laughs> is um, rather the problem is summed up by the word prolix, which refers to language that is excessively verbose and unnecessarily wordy, even ungainly, as in that clunky, jargon-dependent writing that strings out technical words without shaping them. <laughs> And I just, I, 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 <laughs> what I, what I sort of chuckle about with this is this, this sort of, um, this sort of self-deprecation that comes with that because all of us up here are clearly interested in this verbose, excessively ver verbose and kind of wordy, whether we're using actual English language or whatever language we want to speak or whether we're using um, sim symbology. Mm -hmm. and other kinds of signification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I, I kind of am a, um, I celebrate prolixity in a way, personally, myself, um, because I think it creates a certain level of complexity. And when you have a certain level of complexity, you kind of lose your footing. And when you lose your footing, you kind of fall into this, I guess what, what Sandra, what you would call that interstitial, interstitial space so maybe um, I would love to hear what you would have to say or what anyone else has to say about this idea of like the spaces in between understanding, right? The, the John Locke piece is so, what's so amusing about it, reading it in 2015 is how he was so convinced that there was a science to this and yeah. that there was like a method to this madness. Right. And it's and it's almost it, it's almost entertaining in a way to read, like really, you think you can really make sense out of all of this? And then this idea that, that um, you know, you show the, the, the apes clicking, and you show the cat just, and there's this sort of lack of rationality, there's this lack of understanding, but it makes so much sense to me, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? So, I think someone said something recently about um, figuring out how dolphins tell, I think they said this, uh, they discovered they have a sort of poetic Communication that they've been able to, to, to see. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just it's amazing. But again, it's and but yet, the, it, it's that thing of we laugh at it because we don't understand it. Um, we laugh, or those people didn't laugh at, but they it's it's kind of the inverse. Um, we're cruel to that person because they didn't understand it, and so um, it's that double bind we have. I mean, it's 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 all we have. Um, but I think the whole point, though, I just want to say this because we're so much talking about language, that though, but the beauty of art is precisely what I said before. There's always something that's beyond our ability to understand. Otherwise, it isn't art. You know, it's a dogmatic or didactic thing. And with each of you, um, that's what's so powerful about it. So I just want to bring us back to that. Um, well, Talking about prolixity and um, so and and the whole kind of um, often what we perceive to be unnecessarily complex or complicated like uh, academic language. So, little anecdote: when I first tried to read um, Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand <laughs> Plateaus, 
I got so mad. <laughs> I was just so angry. Or Derrida, you know. I just got so angry, you know. And just, um, why is there such an elitism um, in, in academic languages? Why can't you make it like... Uh, understandable for like a, a commoner <laughs> as the English would say <laughs> and um, so I put up this resistance and this you know I'm not going to even bother reading this um, until after a while something clicked and I kind of pushed through a barrier and just kind of to a certain extent let it wash over me and kind of let it I, I basically got carried away with the rhythm of what was going on and then I realized well it's really as much as about, as it is about what is being said it's about the performativity of the language yeah, itself and um, then it clicked and I think that's how I feel or that's what I aspired to like use my language um, in a way in, in my work um, so the um, for instance the, the telephone piece where I start layering sounds um anomatopoeias or um and then the 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 Georges Perec um you know the the paint names that I listed so that that kind of you know thing in between rationality and nonsense but um it, it's a performance it's a, about the performativity I feel so. I like that idea <laughs> I'm actually curious if any of you have questions that you want to ask the panel because I don't want to Well, um, that is a, those are etchings, so that was an exercise in which I put a plate in front of myself and I had no idea what I was going to do with it at that moment. And I've been working with lines for a long time. I did a show actually at SVA two years ago in which I had a work called Line of Flight in which I had a, it was a fairly big installation, there was things hanging, there was photographs, films, there was, there was text on the walls, there was like narratives about going and where to go and kind of a rewriting of the narrative over and over. And I was taking from the um, concept that Deleuze and Gattari use in the Thousand Plateaus of the line of flight as this kind of journey or path that you go without knowing where you're leading. So this is kind of like I've been working with lines taken from that perspective initially. And so going back to this work, uh, so I did that plate and I started to printing it and I was doing that simultaneously, I mean, in, a, during, in parallel to working the materials, uh, working to, to my reference materials for the documentary and at one point, in which uh, when I first came up with a when I when I first started, I was like, okay, so how do I start this? How do I structure this without being di over didactic, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. without using those like I have I have wonderful phrases from my interviews. I have like things that like that they're really beautiful, but I just didn't want to go there and did it, do it in that way. So it's like okay, so how what is the most abstract mm -hmm. I can go? And it just made sense to me to use something that I was, I was already working. And those lines for me are also a representation of this um, struggle between rationality and um, emotion. So if you look at them, they're kind of like they're more or less, they have more or less the same distance between each other. And I had marks for that beginning and end, but the lines are actually hand mm -hmm. hand drawn. They're, I drew the lines, so this is, these are my hand. Or maybe it's a resting point, a because resting it's point. really difficult. Like if uh, if you relate, uh, if you relate to madness to to some extent which I think most people should because I, I kind of believe it is in us and we just manifest at different moments in different ways and different levels. And like 
it's impossible to be under pressure all the time. You need you need escape. You need relaxation. You need some peace. Otherwise, you're just in that continuous spiral that never ends. So me, to me, in a sense, is kind of as I'm as I'm t as I'm trying to approach the thing, my thing as possibilities and not as impossibilities. Maybe maybe the lines come as as that the possibilities for escape. Can I, can I step in? Because I'm so glad you brought mm -hmm. that up because I've been wanted to have that on mm -hmm. actually for this discussion because I think that the, that work, you know, at, at, at first when I saw it, I was sort of, you know, looking at it in relationship and with the piece and, and thought that it seemed very distanced. And I now think it's a distillation of this entire show. I think it's a beautiful evocation because it's, it's I mean, one, many things. One, it's almost like handwriting paper gone awry and I think of Ellen Gallagher's work where she used uh, she's an artist who actually drew hand line um, based on on the handwriting paper she was given as a child growing up um, um, and they also look to me and I said this to you almost like cuts and skin like mm -hmm. for a cutter right and then thinking about the way cutters can sometimes cut uh, language in and that that cutting is a process of of, of an absence of language. It's, it's that the pain is so bad, there's nowhere to go, and you have to manifest it that way. So it's also related to language. But also that it's about anomaly, because it's all about, there's all of these lines, and then you have at the end those squares, and, and, and anomaly is really, again, what's um, very much a, a, a question of um, how language is presented. And, and it's in many ways what your systems are about, too. Um, um, you understand them based on, on realizing that, that there are, there's a system of things that make sense and don't make sense, but anomaly is, is sort of important to all of it. Yeah. So anyway, I think it's a beautiful piece, actually. Thank you. Just, uh, I just want to say something else very quickly <laughs> regardless to what you said before, and actually touch to something that Thursa said. Um, at one point, Teresa said, uh, like, as in talking about madness, she used the expression of the absence of language. And then she brought up, and I brought up that too, the thing of uh, the animal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so great because you, yeah, you have that wonderful. And uh, yeah. it's funny because one of the, in one of the best interviews, uh, which was an interview with a psychoanalyst uh, I did in Rio uh, while I was doing a uh, shooting for a documentary uh, at one point she she was she made a critique in her in, in, in when, when she was talking about uh, madness and she was she was making this critique and about how society in, in general still deals with madness and she was saying that the one of the problems is that the madness is in a sense this um, this absence of language in the sense that it, you have all, a lot of people theorizing about madness, but madness itself, it was probably, um, it, it, it's a, to some extent a manifestation about not having a language to communicate. Or a disruption of, I mean, I, I just want to But be, then for me, it's like this kind of resonates. It's yeah. kind of like, is it an absence of language or is that we are not actually engaging in right, communicating, right. because that was what caught my attention in Cass's work. I would almost, yeah, maybe use the word failure of language, but again, yeah, I guess here we'd have to talk about sort of um, uh, language as a system and then the private language and, and that kind of thing. But I just want to say that, that the word madness, we're using it here, and, and I think we all agree that we have to be careful with a word like that and that, you know, you use m mental illness, and that's why I wanted to speak out, you know, exactly each one. Um, because it's really about, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. Mental illness is horrible. There's nothing poetic about it if you have it mm -hmm. or know anybody who has it. Um, and yet, the surrealists, Baudelaire, many, you know, madness in art have often been, been um, conjoined for obvious reasons. But I think it is that manner of either the manifestation of language that like, as I said, with depression, it's really about not being able, you can't describe it. If any of you have ever had real depression, not just a bad mood, you can't describe it to people. 
Um, and um, schizophrenia is, is also always about um, sort of a bizarre language dis disorder um, of some kind. And so I don't know, it would be interesting to sort of go through the different specific manifestations of it. Um, and some of it is, is culturally constructed and some of it is very much biological, you know, mm -hmm. it's all of those things, all, all of the above. But. And if I can just jump off on that as well, in, in relation to all three of your work, which is, um, I feel that all three of you deal with this idea of limits, right, of like the boundary, and in particular the boundary between um, kind of what's expected and then what's actually happening, or what's real, or what's I would use the word poetic for a lot of what's happening in the show. Um, you know, with, with this idea of madness, you know, in shamanic cultures, there, there are a lot of belief systems around what we call schizophrenia, for example, being um, at a higher spiritual state, for example, um, someone who's actually communing with a different plane of existence. Um, you know, what we think of as, as normal in, in institutions, like we're sitting up here in this table and you guys are sitting there and there's this video and there are these microphones and there's these pieces of paper. This is all sort of like how we order normalcy and, and what you're doing in your work is you're really kind of turning that inside out and showing us the, the humor of it and then also the absurdity, the absurdity of those structures and, and what you're doing is you're showing us the absurdity in a way of, of relegating what we call art with a capital A to this sort of limitation. Um, there was this, there's this beautiful piece by Foucault, a, a preface to transgression, where he talks about this idea of transgression as, you know, we normally think of something that is transgressive as going outside of the limit. So there's an inside and an outside. What you were saying earlier, there's an inside and an outside. Um, and he actually talks about transgression as the, the space between and the spiral. Nice. Yeah. That's so he talks better. about the spiral yeah. and like how there's like, lots of spaces, lots of limitations, and, and lots of borders that we kind of move around. And, and I guess more as like parting words for, for this awesome discussion that we've had is that um, I, I feel like what you all have done, all four of you in your practice and in this conversation is really talk about that spiral mm -hmm. so that it doesn't become about the black or the white, but it really becomes mm -hmm. this, this really beautiful movement. Um, so I thank you for that. <laughs> um, unless there's any other questions? Um, well, when I first went to the room, I got slightly scared because they, were, they had severe limitations in the ways they communicated. They spoke very little and some of them would be, would move in a sort of like sometimes a spasmodic spasmodic kind mm -hmm. of like ways which which can be scary if you don't know who you're dealing with or what's happening there but very very quickly that was transformed into fascination because Cassie was pretty much well she was she was primarily working with uh, sensations so she was she would touch them she would like hug them sometimes she would kind of like provide actually she talks about it and there was one of the interviews talks about it as well she used her own body as a continent for them so she used her own body and she worked through the senses like the sight the sounds the smell, she would bring up like uh, spray bottles with scents that were calming. She was like, she, was, she would just use all possible senses to make they, them feel safe and that they could actually communicate. So it was not very complicated. And I tried myself, not only with them, but outside in the streets and it worked. And like most of the time, I think we don't do because we're scared of it, because we just don't know how to do it. And we're scared because it, it can be dangerous, actually, like someone who is actually having a, an attack or something can be dangerous. But mostly they're not and they won't be. But it requires a little bit of availability of the bodies, I think, mm -hmm. to 
communicate to be able to communicate so it's like sometimes i mean if someone that you don't know comes at you and like grabs your arm and with a more kind of stronger uh take you'll feel scared by it like you i mean your automatic response will be try to repel from it and what cassia taught me since the very beginning and actually this is one of the things she told me the first day if they touch you don't like respond mm -hmm. aggressively mm -hmm. just like calm down look look at mm -hmm. them in the eyes and like if it hurts you it's possible to talk to them most of the times and this is i mean it's it's not that difficult we're just not taught to do it we think like well if they don't speak if they don't look in the eyes like they don't communicate it's not my problem like they should be incarcerated this is kind of how society deals with it most of the time so it seems like a brilliant radical it is form of, of therapy that it quite, is quite extraordinary um thank you for telling us about that I, I i wanted to also just add that part that a good film for you all to go home and look at that would be beautiful for this topic and this discussion is Werner herzog's casper hauser beautiful film and it's about many of these same issues um so i just thought of that while you were talking well, thank you so much. We're unfortunately out of time. Um, but thank you all for being here and your attention. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.